the point of this is to provide the best facts driven show that we possibly can ideally you have a glue guy who is good hashtag glue guy hashtag locker room guy you can't go sign bobby holy to a trillion dollars you can't do these things very satisfying the absolute best nyr show in town this is the liberty blue liberty blue Rangers Podcast. Rangers Podcast. With Andrew Chelby. Andrew Chelby. And Nick Zoraris. Nick Zoraris. Rangers fans, welcome to the best Rangers podcast in town. I am Andrew Chelney alongside Nick Zararis, and we are Liberty Blue. We scream about the Rangers so that you can save your voice. That's how deeply we care about you, and we appreciate that you've joined us for the ride. This is episode 11. We'll put the full video up on our YouTube, Liberty Blue Podcast, and the audio version will be available wherever else you ever get your audio podcast whether it be apple spotify etc we are at liberty blue pod on twitter and instagram at chelney andrew c-h-e-l-n-e-y andrew and at nick zararis at nick z-a-r-a-r-i-s are our personal handles to follow on twitter as well nick we're recording early again now why why is that well mr winhurst if if you didn't see that i'm doing the brian winhurst meme but yes why why is that well, Mr. Winhurst, I'm going to the Met game tonight. Uh, I'm looking out the window every few minutes. The sky is still very gray. It's not raining anymore, but it looks like rain is in the forecast. So we're going to see what happens. I very well might just be in the Bronx for like three hours, hoping this game is played and it doesn't get played at all. I pay $20 for chicken tenders and French fries and then come home. So we're going to see what happens on that front. Uh, we're recording Monday afternoon, so not too much earlier. We do get the NHL news of the day, so we can start there. The Islanders. The, Lule Marillo is alive. We we can confirm reports yeah. <laughs> from Long Island that Lule Marillo is alive. He has been seen in public. He was holding today's newspaper. We know it was not a stage picture. The Islanders <laughs> have awoken from their slumber and finalized some transactions that we assumed were going to happen for quite some time. And of course, since the last time we recorded, finalized a transaction that did not happen. The insider game of telephone was not correct. They were all passing around misinformation. So let's start with the news that happened today because that's fresher and most people have already gotten their dosage of cadre conversation by now. But we'll start there. They lock up Romanov, who they got from Montreal. They give Dobson a multi-year extension coming off of a nice breakout 50-point season. And they give Kiefer Bellows, a restricted free agent, a little more than he's probably worth based on what he's given them. But this tells you the Islanders think they're going to be a playoff team and probably nothing more than that. They think we'll bring back the group we had last year. As long as our luck isn't awful like it was in the 2021-2022 season, we feel like we'll be a playoff team. And that's a good thing for the Rangers, to be honest with you. That's one less team in the division that I have to be worried about, to be frank with you. I would never count out the Islanders for a few reasons. One one of which, after they got healthy on, in the second part of the last season, they were really good. They yeah. looked really good. They they played well together as a team. They didn't have the the star power that some other teams had, but they they were close to a playoff spot towards the tail. Like they were they were gaining a lot of momentum, a lot of steam. They fell they fell off at the very end, but for the a lot of maybe all star break and beyond, they were they look like a really solid and scary team to potentially play in the playoffs. It didn't work out, and they and they didn't make the playoffs. Uh, you know, at the at the end there, but they were they were looking like a good team. And the idea from Lou is okay. The same exact team that we had last season that only missed the playoffs pretty much because of historically bad injury injury luck. Like if we can do this, if we can bring the same exact team back next year. We're gonna get better. We're gonna get better luck and therefore better success. I understand where Lou's coming from. the The one thing that I don't understand is okay. Then why is Trotz not there? If yeah. you're gonna bring everybody else back, you sign literally zero free agents. You sign zero of them. They did not sign one, and I'm writing them off. They didn't sign two, and I'm writing them off. They signed zero free agents. So if you bring back the exact same team that you had. And your thought process is, we did not make the playoffs because our injury luck was bad. Then why did you change your coach? 
Why did you do that? I understand that Lane Lambert has been Trotz's right hand man for years and years and years. In you know, go back to Washington, and now he's in, in. He's in now he's on Long Island, and now he has the reins and all these things. I understand that. But if you want to bring everybody else back, why didn't you bring back your head coach? What was it? Maybe, maybe Barry Trotz didn't want to coach next season. We saw that after he got let go by the Islanders, he got multiple job offers, and he was like, "Ah, I'm gonna take a break, and I'll come back later." Maybe he maybe he did that on Long Island too, but they worded it as if he was let go instead of Barry Trotz taking a break. So the Islanders let go Barry Trotz, and that's that's all you did. That well. No other I changes? Hate, Zero. I hate I hate to contribute to the game of telephone here because this is all going to be, you know, secondhand information that I've heard from people that I have no way of independently verifying myself. But my Islander fan friends tell me that Lou that Trotz got let go because he went to Lou and said, I want to have a little bit more input in the roster construction that I want to have a little bit more of a say of the types of players we go out and acquire. And from what I understand, that was part of the pitch the Winnipeg Jets made to him was if you come here, we will solicit your input in the roster. And then once you're, you're done with coaching, we will transition you to a front office role. Something that is, I believe is part of what Trotz wanted here on Long Island. And ultimately Based on what we know, I can see a world in which that's true because we know Lou is a bit of a control freak. He's got to have things his way. If you don't play his game, he's going to shut you out, isolate you, and not work with you. So for his coach to come to him and say, hey, Lou, can I have a little bit of input here on what we're doing with the roster so we can I can get more out of them? We've had a really good run here the last couple of seasons. They went to a conference final twice, but they were right there on the margins. They needed a little bit more, and they never really made any attempts to get over that finish line to improve the roster beyond what they already had. And that's going to be a real thing to consider here, that we have not seen the Islanders not coached by Barry Trotz in a while. It feels a little... I don't premature to just assume they're going to be the same defensive juggernaut they've always they were under Lou with, under Lou under Trotz with a different head coach. I, I feel like that's something we got to account for here because it takes time. I mean, uh, Ranger fans can attest to this. You saw it the first ten to fifteen games of Gallant. You saw it the first ten to fifteen games of David Quinn. The first ten to fifteen games of Elaine Vigneault. New coach, even if it's somebody who's familiar with the group, it takes a while for everything to kind of fall into place and everyone to get comfortable. It is a little bit different because Lane has been with Barry yeah. Trotz for a million years and they've won a cup together. They, they've they been through thick and thin for, for years and years together behind the bench. So it's a little bit different in, in, in that sense where you're not just bringing in a different head coach from somebody from somewhere else and inserting them into into this into this position. This is somebody that ha that knows Bear Trotz's system like the back of his hand. And if there's anybody that can replicate his system that's not Barry Trotz himself, it would be Lane Lambert. But again, at the end of the day, Lane Lane is not Barry Trotz. There's going to be things different the way that he sees the game as opposed to how Barry saw the game. And that could be a good thing. I'm not here to say that, oh, yeah. you know, just because Lane isn't Barry Trotz is going to do a worse job. That's not what I'm suggesting. Uh, what I'm saying, you know, what we're saying is that w Lane knows the system more than anybody else does besides Barry, but ultimately he's not Barry. So we are going to see changes in those systems. It's just a matter of time before October before, when we start to see, okay, are these good changes? How are the Islanders tweaking their system to maybe be a, a faster team, maybe a, a less you know shut down and get eight shots on goal and score on five of them kind of team. Like maybe, maybe they go and do that. But, but lane, if there's, if there's anybody that can succeed a head coach and implement a very similar style, it's lane Lambert. That Yeah, it definitely is a unique situation. You very rarely see that type of thing in any sport where somebody who's underneath somebody stays with them after they leave the organization, when they're the one who brought them in. Um, the other part of this is, they bring in somebody in Romanov who is only 21, 22 years old, doesn't have a ton of NHL experience. I think he has less than 100 games played at the NHL level, something like that. He was in and out of the Montreal lineup during their cup final run, more matchup dependent. But in a vacuum, replasing Chara, who respectful at the end of his career, 43 years old, 44 sure, years sure. old, whatever he was last year, one of the best defensemen of his era. But last year, we, we can all acknowledge Chara was relying just on his reach, not a lot of foot speed, not a lot of ability to play good angles. So in theory, if you have Pelic Pulak 
and then you have Dobson with Romanov, and Romanov is actually capable of moving the puck and playing a little bit of defense, that's a pretty good top four. It, it's very much projecting and assuming just because Romanov's in a better environment and playing with a better partner, he's going to improve. But when you have the external factors able to just make their starting out point better, I think that goes a long way in helping somebody, especially a younger defenseman, play better. If you have less things to worry about, that's going to make you better at your job. Yes, the Islander system is very demanding of its defensemen in the way it forces them to be willing to block shots and to take the body and cut away shooting angles. That's going to require a little bit of adaptation from the dumpster fire that the Canadians were the last last year, at least. Romanov is going to be an interesting prospect, and it's really because you traded your first round pick for him. I, I before we jumped on, I was I was following along on Twitter on Lou's press conference and he said, I wasn't planning on trading my first round pick at the draft, but that's what Montreal wanted for Romanov. So I said, okay, fine. It, we're projecting and we're doing this based on okay, I guess, because that's what they asked for. I mean, we we like poke fun at the GMs for not really like investigating further or trying to get the best deal they can. That's all that was the, that was the end of the conversation. We want your first round pick. Okay. That was it, Lou. <laughs> there wasn't a follow-up like, could we do this instead or that instead? Could we try this maybe? Because uh, I know they asked about um what's his name? But they asked about Anthony Bavillier, the forward, uh, as one of the pieces, and probably less draft capital going back if it's Bavillier and like a three for Romanov. And even that I still feel like isn't great for the Islanders because yeah. notorious notorious ranger killer Anthony Bavillier is a good hockey player. He is a good hockey player, and maybe I, I would imagine, because Lou's been around a million trillion years in the NHL at this point, that he, that there was at least yeah. some kind of back back and forth going <laughs> yeah. on. But just you know, out of this for the sake of simplicity, he was like, oh, they they wanted the first, you know, and we gave it to him. Like, I'm sure there was a I'm sure Lou did everything he possibly could have to be like, what about this? What about what about six seventh round picks? Would you do six seventh round picks for Alexander Romanov? And Montreal, you know, rightfully was like, click. So they didn't, they didn't, you know, they didn't get that done. And eventually they, they settled on the, on the trade that got it done. So I'm sure Lou had, you know, his, his, his trade tree and like all these things set up. And Montreal was like, either you give us a first or we're hanging up the phone. And Lou was like, no, but wait. So, so he got the trade done with Romanov. There's not a whole lot of NHL data to, to glean from the, the data that we have isn't very positive, but there's not like, you can't really base his future in the NHL off of, less than 100 games in the NHL with a team that was real bad. Like yeah, he was he was in and out of the lineup during the cup final run and all that, but like were they were they really that good of a team in the final? I mean, they they were the they were the the bottom seed in the first round. And they and Toronto basically was like, "Ah, we'll give it to you. Ah, we'll give it to you." And and Toronto being Toronto lost in the first round again. And then Montreal was like, okay, well, we're here. We might as well start winning now. And they did. And they made it to the final. Only, you know, they they bowed out, but it was it was a hell of a run. Last year, they were a complete dumpster fire. Like it was it wasn't even entertaining to watch. It was it was just bad. There are some teams that are hilariously bad. The Canadians last year were just bad. And it was it was brutal to watch for, at some points. They got a lot better under Marty St. Louis when he took over as head coach. But Dominique Ducharme just did not know how to handle that team well when he was their head coach after that playoff run. So is Romano going to be better than we saw in Montreal? It would be tough not to be. Yeah. But yeah. with with the with a defenseman like that, it's sometimes difficult to tell. But yeah, the stats aren't good right now. But I want to see how he does in a totally different system that focuses on defense first and and how to be supportive of your defensive partner in uh, you know on a team like the Islanders as opposed to shrug shrug emoji that the Canadians employed for much of last year. So while you were talking, I went and fact checked the 133 NHL games over the course of two seasons. So not a ton of sample to work with. Usually, you don't really know what somebody is at the NHL level till probably they've played 
two to three seasons. And if there's somebody like this who was just in a difficult situation, it's even more difficult to ascertain whether it's a product of them being in an awful team situation. And how much can one player be, how much good can one player do in a really bad situation, especially a defenseman on a team that pretty much had every other defenseman on in their original six defensemen from opening night get hurt. It's really hard to determine what Romanov is at this point. From what I was reading, I, um, Corey Pronman started doing his um, his ranking of all 32 teams prospect systems. He had the Islanders at 27th and mentioned what his blurb about Romanov was, He's probably never going to give you counting stats, not a lot of points or goal, uh, assists or goals. But in theory, he should be pretty good in transition defense at, pre at preventing zone entries, which is something the Islanders are very good at to begin with. So that's a clear situation of Lou identifying we're good at this and he can execute this. So this is a situation where the system and the traits match. So that's a good move for them. And when we talk about the other part of this, where we're going to talk about Kadri now, because we've spent 15 minutes talking about the three RFAs, the Islanders signed. Um, what was your initial reaction when you saw the Kevin Weeks tweet that Western Conference team big news deal the day before that morning? And then I, I actually, I, I will say, I heard this from somebody that this was going to happen. And being that I'm a journalist, I have no way of confirming it. I don't report it. That yeah. is how journalism is supposed to work. If you have no way of confirming information, do not report it. Don't say I'm hearing this because that yeah. that's what everybody who was playing telephone for a month and a half did. We did an episode of this show assuming that this was going to happen because the most noted NHL insider, Elliot Friedman, on his podcast, which is pushed by Sportsnet, the biggest media company in Canada, yeah, a lot of people we talk to, they think the silence around Kadri means that Lou's already got this done, that they're just waiting for the right time to announce it because Lou's going to have to make other roster transactions to fit Kadri in. And then we get to last week. I believe it was Thursday of last week. Kadri is signing in Calgary. And we are here now about a week, a few days later. And Calgary looks like they're going to be one of the truly true contenders in that Western Conference for at least next season. Uh, beyond that, you get it's a little more hairy math wise. But the Flames had a really good offseason considering they lost two players from a really good team last year. And two of, I would say, like the 25 best players in the entire league. It's hard to have a good offseason when you lose a Matthew Kachuk and a Johnny Gaudreau. But the Flames did a decent job. The Flames have salvaged what could have been a disaster of an offseason. Brad Living deserves an award. And and, and yeah. it's not necessarily, maybe it's best GM at the end of the season, but he's just, he deserves so much credit because you think, you think of, you think of it this way. You, you fight with Johnny Gaudreau for weeks and weeks and weeks, begging and like you're, you're overpaying him. You're giving him the key to the city. You're doing all of these things to try to keep your best player. And he says, no, I'm leaving you. You're getting nothing in return and I'm going to Columbus. Right. He he has he did Brad did everything he could to to keep him there. Okay, Johnny Johnny Gaudreau's gone now. Matt Kachuk wants out. Okay, now you have to facilitate a trade for Matthew Kachuk, who was your second best second best forward on the team. You get Jonathan Huberto back. You get Mackenzie Weger back. You get Mackenzie Weger back. Like we should not be a throw in. He's a very good defenseman in his own yeah. right. So okay, so now you now you recoup that. Okay, you still have that hole that Johnny Goudreau left you. Now you sign Nazem Kadri. And with that, I would rather Goudreau and Kachuk over Huberdeau and Kadri. However, given what has transpired and given what has happened over the course of free agency, this is by far the best kind of, I don't want to say safety net, but like the best kind of bounce back that yeah. a GM can have in such a short amount of time when you lose your two best players, both of them want out. You have to figure out not only how to get good return for one of them, but how to replace somebody who is your best player and you and, and just left you with nothing in return for him. And for Brad Tra living to get uh, Johnny good. Uh, yeah. Not Johnny good Uh, uh, Jonathan Huberdeau, Mackenzie Weger, and also now signing Nazem Kadri is massive for them because now they don't have to 
break it all down. They don't have to do any of those things. They're still a contender now. They're the, if they were a decent Jacob Markstrom away from from getting there. Like they, I don't know what happened yeah. to him uh, against Edmonton, but like they 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 are a very good team. And for Bradshaw Living to to see so much action happening over the por- course of the, the last couple of months and to rebound the way he has, it's been outstanding. I, yeah, I mean, we see this all the time. We see this a lot more in basketball, where when one star leaves, the entire roster just gets gutted to start over because that's the way you operate in basketball. Because you only have to play nine to 10 guys most nights. You can turn over a roster relatively quickly. Hockey, usually when a superstar leaves, it takes that team a while to kind of figure it out. I mean, I funny enough, I was ta- I was at a wedding over the weekend. And my girlfriend was walking by and two of her uncles are Islander fans. And they were, they were still complaining about John Tavares leaving the Islanders. And this is, you know, four years later that the Islander fans are still kind of, well, we need another superstar in this team. And we had one, but he didn't want to stay. So the fact that the Flames were able to say, okay, we lost a superstar. Okay. We can get Huberto in. He's not Johnny Gaudreau. He's pretty close. He's 85, 90%. I mean, I, I do think Johnny Gaudreau's, talent gets kind of lost in the scope of things because he plays in the same era as a Connor McDavid, as a Leon Dreisaitl. But Johnny Gaudreau has, I think, three top fives in the Hart Memorial voting. To finish top five in MVP three, four times on a team like Calgary, that's really damn impressive. To put up 100-point seasons where that line, when it was humming last year with Gaudreau, Kachuk, and Lindholm, all three of those guys had at least 30 goals. Two of them broke 100 points. One of the best lines of the last five to 10 years. Maybe one of the best lines to not feature. If you want to exclude lines, including Connor McDavid, maybe the best line of the last five years. If you want to argue that maybe some variation of Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, and William Nylander, okay, I'd have that argument. But when you talk about having this kind of offseason, Calgary is going to be in the mix. Everybody is kind of just assuming Colorado looks like they're going to be the same thing. After Colorado, the West is kind of wide open, and I really like Calgary's offseason, and they're going to be right there. I know a lot of people are just banking on the Vegas bounce back, but with no Robin Lehner for an entire year, I don't I don't really see it unless they can pull a starting goalie out of their ass somehow. I really don't see it for Vegas. So Calgary's going to be right there. This is going to be another good opportunity for them, and that Western Conference, it it is available. I was gonna make a, a an Alex Georgiev joke, but he's not here anymore, so he so yeah. the, he, he avoids that that stray. But with Calgary, it's true. The one thing that we that we forgot to mention is that they traded Sean Monahan to Montreal. They yes. traded Sean Monahan and a first round pick just to get rid of that contract to Montreal, so they could sign Nazem Kadri. So while yeah, you don't want to give up a first round pick and that kind of deal, you have to do that because Sean Monahan went from a second line center to a healthy scratch with that kind of a massive contract. And for Montreal, uh, I, I put this out on Twitter and I got a couple of responses about this. And I, I asked the question, if if Jeff Gordon and Ken Hughes are, you, are kind of weaponizing their cap space and saying, hey, we'll take your players and your contracts, but you better give us draft picks to make it happen, why didn't Jeff Gordon do that in, in New York? And the, the responses that I got to that, well, well, this seems like a Montreal kind of thing. Uh, a thought process of that that doesn't necessarily include Jeff Gordon in it. Uh, now, again, he was one of the people that made this deal. But in terms of the thought process of weaponizing your cap space, this seems to be more like a Kent Hughes slash other idea as opposed okay. to Jeff Gordon bringing it to the table. But again, we don't know that for sure. And this is just off of responses that I saw on Twitter. But I think it's a question that should be asked, if nothing else. Okay, so I actually have a reasonable theory for this. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we were talking about David Quinn's time with New York, that they kind of screwed up the entire idea of a rebuild when they signed two guys to nineteen and a half, twenty million dollars worth of contracts in Truba and Finarin. And that very kind of that that sped up the timeline. Ideally, in a rebuild, you have a few years for your first, your second, your your highly valued guys that you drafted wherever you got them in the lottery to just play 20 minutes a night. And if the team sucks, that's that's part of the process. They just need the ice time to get the process down. And 
Instead, the Rangers saw an opportunity to immediately improve the roster, get right back to the fringe of being a playoff team, and they kept all of that money available going into the summer of 2019, knowing that Artemi Panarin was going to be there, and I would assume they had heard through back channels that he would be willing to come, and they made that, they set up the way an NBA team sets up their offseason, where they get all the expiring contracts out, they have as much cap space as possible, and say, all right, this is our guy, we're going to get him, we got to have him, and they did that with Panarin, they heard Truba was available. A lot of people, Rangers were linked to Truba the first time he was a restricted free agent and he didn't pl- sign until like the last week of November where that deadline is for restricted free agents, where if they don't sign by December 1st, they're not eligible to play the rest of that year. That first time the Rangers were linked to Truba because they had been really high on him on the draft that year he got drafted. That's my answer to your question. If the Rangers really, really wanted to slow play out a rebuild that probably still wouldn't be over yet, they would have weaponized their cap space a lot further. I, I know hockey stat miner was talking about that for the better part, 2018, 2017 and 2018 to say, let's just be aggressive here. We know we're not going to be that good. We have all this cap space. Let's take a shitty contract, get some extra picks in here. Then even if we don't need the picks, we can trade that for stuff. That's your answer. The Rangers never felt that they were that far away. They thought they would just hit the ground running with two or three of these pick guys. They took in the top 10. That's including the ones that haven't panned out like mm-hmm. Leah Sanderson, who's in another organization now. Sure. And but also for, not doing well there either. Yes. Yes. For all intents and purposes, that, that would be my guess. The Rangers never really felt like, well, they did issue the letter. They traded away all their stars. They were very eagerly awaiting for the next star to come walking in the door because they, they, for whatever reason, the Rangers are just the antithesis of the organization is just to wait and be patient. I was reading something the other day that someone in the athletic did talking about the the all time free agent class, blah, blah, blah. And one of the jabs in it, because it's written in a comedic tone, was you would be surprised how few Rangers are in here, considering how much the Rangers have spent in free agency over the years. While Panarin has been a resounding success as a free agent. Most of the Rangers free agents are a little overpaid because the Rangers had to have them and everybody who's an unrestricted free agent gets overpaid. So it speaks to a view on how you acquire talent. The Rangers have always been a, we will pay top dollar for talent because we struggle with developing our own. And in that sense, we got to have as much cap space as possible because we know Anything is possible once the summer comes. I mean, there was the year that Steven Stamkos was about to become an restri- unrestricted free agent at noon. And I remember watching TSN in my room at my desk I'm sitting at right now and Bob McKenzie saying, well, if Stamkos makes it to unrestricted free agency, don't be surprised if the Rangers get a meeting with him. The Rangers at the time had $1.5 million in cap space. The Rangers are always going to be linked to people because the Rangers have shown a willingness to be aggressive in that space. And it's why they didn't weaponize cap space as much as they should have. And as much as we all like to think it, it, the team that's mastered, this is the coyotes. The coyotes may never be, they may never actually assemble a good NHL roster, (laughs) but they're going to have 35, 40 draft picks over three years. That's the, that is the most, volume shooter strategy you can possibly have that is the russell westbrook of nhl roster yeah. construction strategies 40 field goals eight go in he still gets a triple double the coyotes are never going to get out of the first round <laughs> of the playoffs it, that's the other end of the spectrum the rangers are just never going to be willing to do that unfortunately well the arizona coyotes right now are doing what the oklahoma city thunder are doing in which here let's yes. let me get let me get eighty five thousand draft picks and I'm just going to use some of them, and yeah. then and then uh, the Thunder right now aren't doing this, but I would imagine they will sooner rather than later. Is hey, let's trade some of these 86 draft picks that we have to acquire actual talent because not every single like we've we've said this multiple times on the show before, but not every single draft pick that you have is one going to become a player that is part of your organization, and two, you only have so many spots on your team. You can't assume that if you have 13 draft picks in one season, that all 13 players are going to be players on your own team. That's just not how this works. Like you, you have a lot of picks. You, you trade. You ideally trade a, a bulk of them away for talent that is either going to be really good or is very good. And yeah. the idea, you know, the, the the idea is that these draft picks could be anything. They could even be the talent that you're acquiring, right? The 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 Family Guy uh, yes. clip of like, 
the you know the, you you either want you could either have a boat or you could have what's in the box. And Peter goes, oh, th- there could be anything in the box. It could even be another boat. Like that's kind of that's kind of the thought process with when dealing with trade when uh, with dealing with draft picks is it, it, it when, once you acquire a lot of them. You should trade most of them away for actual good talent to fill out your roster and to build something for the future. I like what Montreal's done. I like the idea that they they've enacted since they brought in Marty St. Louis and said, we know we're not going to be very good, but for the sake of being good three years from now, we need a coach who's going to be patient, who's developmental, and knows how to communicate effectively. It's one of the things that strikes me most about Mike Sullivan, that strikes me about Marty St. Louis, that you got to be able to effectively communicate. And the coaches who treat the media as something that they have to do and just kind of blow it off and give shitty answers, those are guys missing opportunities where, yes, I understand Messaging to the public is not as important to the messaging as the players, but you can't be bothered to put a modicum of effort into talking to us. And then I see these clips of Mike Sullivan and Marty St. Louis talking to their players during practice. And it's like, yeah, why can't every coach just be like that? Why is it? Why does everybody? I, I understand the authoritarian streak that comes from the older mindset of sports. The the coaches who are proud that they make their players puke when they run laps kind of thing. That kind of thing. There's a reason that's going out of style slowly but surely. The authoritarian coach has its place. There is a point where a coach needs to be able to galvanize their group and be a hard ass. But especially in a developmental situation like the Canadians are going to be in the next few years, having a coach who's going to say, it's okay to make a mistake. You can make a mistake. You're not going to get benched. That's really important. The The change in Cole Caulfield's confidence, just on playing the puck after St. Louis became the head coach and he came back from the AHL, he just felt so much more confident in the, in the ability that, okay, even if I mess this up, I'm not going to get yelled at. I'm going to get my next shift regularly. That is something that needs to be commended. Now, there's no way of knowing if what the Canadians are doing is going to work, but they're acquiring a bunch of young talent. They're going to have a decent amount of cap flexibility in the future. They still have to iron out some stuff, especially with Carey Price's money, which is going to put them in the long-term injured reserve, which gets complicated. I I spent way too much time the other day reading about how off-season long-term injured reserve works versus how in-season long-term injured reserve works, and I still really can't explain it that well. I just know that it's not good for the Canadians, that they're going to be kind of stuck with Carey Price's cap hit unless they can figure some kind of settlement deal out. So the Canadians are going to be in that abyss for a little while, but at the very least, they're acquiring a bunch of young talent and they've got a coach who is really good at communicating, which is part of being a coach. So to get a first round pick, which probably will be in the 20s, but that's still better than not having an extra first round pick and Sean Monaghan in a contract year, Last year, I think he's making six and a quarter million, something like that. He's coming off of two hip surgeries, which is why he hasn't been as good as he was in the past. We all know Sean Monaghan five, six years ago was a pretty good hockey player, but double hip surgery is really tough in hockey to come back from. We'll see what that entails going forward for them. Anything else you want to touch on in this web of Islanders, Flames, Canadians, (laughs) before we talk a little World Juniors and then some hockey idea stuff? It, it, I just wanted to quickly say that coming back from hip surgery and walking yes. is, is pretty difficult. Coming back from double hip surgery and playing professional ice hockey is exponentially more difficult than that. So, yeah, I mean, Sean Monaghan tried his best yeah. to get back, but now hopefully after a, a long off season for him, he is able to get some kind of rhythm going in Montreal. Like, it's, it's, it's just unfortunate more than anything else yeah. with especially because Sean Monaghan is not 40 years old he's still yeah. in his 20s there's still you know ideally a lot of hockey left in him and to have the kind of surgeries that he's had it is very difficult especially on the psyche of a player where you thought you know a few years ago you knew you were a good hockey player and now after these surgeries you can't even crack the lineup like that's got to be tough on you so now in Montreal where he should get more freedom because he's the, the obviously the uh, the uh, Canadians are not as stacked as the Flames are, so he should get more ice time. He should get more freedom to do things, and that should give get him into a rhythm of playing. Hopefully, n- near a level that he knew he could before. Because coming back from those injuries is, I I've never had to go through it. I, I would imagine that hip surgeries, one of them, is very difficult. Two of them, 
I, that's that's next level. So hopefully, hopefully he can bounce back. I I just knocked on my desk for the sake of that. Hopefully, have sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, abs- of course, of course, of course. Sure. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is a this is purely a hypothetical here because I I have it ri- I have it written down here. Of these three teams, who do you think will get to the playoffs first? Montreal, Buffalo, Arizona. Which of those three will play in an NHL playoff game first? That's a really good question. That's a really good question. I think it's Buffalo. I think it's Buffalo. I was starting to think that way because Montreal is it, unless unless something happens next summer where they can acquire free agent talent, which it could happen because Montreal yeah. is a big hub for free agency. Buffalo, if they were to do that, they have their young talent needs to take a big step up in that situation. With Montreal, it's Montreal, right? Uh, Half the league is from Canada. Half the league speaks French. Half the league has, you know, dreamed about playing in the has in in Montreal. Like John Tavares has worn the the Canadians' uh, pajamas to bed. Like, there's a lot of players that have done that growing up. So it is easier for Montreal to acquire good talent in free agency than it is for for the Sabers to do it. So. Yeah, the Buffalo Sabers could beat out the Canadians in that in that sense, but the, the the Sabers do have to take a big jump in how their young talent plays. Because while they did that over the course of this past season, they did look a lot better than they than they did otherwise. There still needs to be another jump, or maybe even two, for them to get there. With Montreal, yeah, they're a dumpster fire right now, but it's Montreal. Like yeah. they can always. There's free agents that always want to go there. There are players that can always at the deadline say, I want to go to Montreal. I want to go to these places. I want to, I want a fresh start. More players that want to go to Montreal than Buffalo. And that's not a knock on Buffalo. That's just that that that's just how the league works. That it just is what it is. Right. Yeah. Like I listen, like I went to I went to Syracuse. Like I went to I was in upstate New York for four years. I know Buffalo's in western New York. Don't come at me. I know. I know. But Montreal is is just a more well liked city amongst hockey players than Buffalo. Like let we can be honest with ourselves here. Uh, would I like to, would I like to see more players go to Buffalo? Yeah, of course. I I want. But Buffalo has been a a trash fire for years and years now. I want Buffalo to be successful. Buffalo is a massive hockey market. All they want is a competitive hockey team. But let's be honest with ourselves. Let's be objective. Montreal is a more attention grabbing city. That's just that it is what it is. So if if Buffalo can make that big jump with their young talent, then they could be out much. They, they could be out the Habs to get to the playoffs first. But all it takes next offseason is for one or two big names to be like, I want to go to Montreal. I want to go play for Marty St. Louis. I want to be the next, you know, whoever. And Montreal all of a sudden is a playoff team. So that's a tough question, but that's a good question. Okay, so the World Junior Tournament, which was paused last December because COVID was very bad, and I, I remember reading a feature-length story that somebody wrote from The Athletic saying that, yeah, we, I got to the hotel, and there were three weddings booked at the same hotel that all the, the Team Canada and Team Slovakia were staying at, and there were no precautions of any kind. And I, I vividly remember just wake, being one day like, why are they? Why did they just think that everything would be fine? And then, lo and behold, to find out that T- Hockey Canada, the organizing body for the tournament, not exactly good at anything. Not good at morals. Yep. Not good at logistics. Ethics. Sure. No, Hockey Canada, not good at anything. No. Canada, I, I course, guess. I guess except winning on the ice, which sure. At, but at, yeah. At, at what cost? Which yeah. Is the yeah. Thing. No. No. And no. Then, uh, yeah. Yeah. They. They. Yeah. They won. But like. Hey, can we deal with the other pretty so, pressing yeah. issues that somehow are not being mentioned or figured out yet? Because there's a like you won, congrats, congrats, golf clap to you. But also, can we figure out the the pro like the monster that's right behind you? Can we turn around maybe? Like that's you wanna you wanna you wanna talk about him because he's there. He's not going away. Because this is a real thing that happens all of the time in sports, especially in sports. It happens in movies too, where you get the, can you separate the art from the artist type thing? And this is a little bit different because this is people who are not involved in a situation representing the same entity that was involved in a situation. So you get into this where personally, I feel 
they probably shouldn't have played team Canada probably shouldn't have gotten an entry in this tournament the way Russia didn't because of the invasion of Ukraine that team Canada should have said, we're removing ourselves from consideration. The next team in the world rankings goes in, everybody slides up a seed, etc. That would have been the ethical thing to do because now you're going to get the, this team in face of all of this adversity that hockey Canada is facing, they persevered and Mason McTavish is going to be a star on the ducks. And everybody can't wait for Connor Bedard. And Brennan Othman had a, and it just, I feel, it feels icky that um, like three weeks ago, we were talking about how awful of an organization this is and that need, more needs to be done to foster a better environment for hockey. And now we're just getting the same, you get the same puff pieces you always get after uh, World Juniors. World Juniors doesn't really, uh, we're American. World Juniors doesn't really matter that, to me as much, nearly as much as it does to the people in Canada, because that's one of the that's one of the tournaments they get to flex. It's fun every couple of years when Team USA upsets them, and we get to do the USA Hockey is Do or Die video with Kreider sure. on from 2000, I think 11, maybe no, nah, that's like 2009 or eight. That God, that's a long time ago. Yeah, it's been a while, but ho- Hockey Canada makes the World Juniors this big event for them to showcase the next generation of great Canadian talent that's going to dominate the NHL and. It just felt very inappropriate is the word I would use to describe for the lavishing of praise on the players on the team. And it's not their fault. It's not anyone on this team's fault that they're representing the same organization. Do what the Olympics did. Do the Canadian athletes of Canada or whatever you want to call it. But it feels really inappropriate that Hockey Canada is going to get to put another trophy and medal in their display case when a month ago we were all collectively saying Hockey Canada is a terrible organization. You're 100 percent right. Uh, if if you're gonna do, if you're gonna let the Canadian athletes play, and by by all sh- you know, by all accounts, obviously these players don't have anything to do with what's going on, and to 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 be like, you know, Team Canada cannot play because of this. Like I I understand where where people are coming from with that, but why why not do a compromise like you're suggesting, yeah. where not Team Canada, but the Canadian athletes that are playing, you know the whatever whatever name that you want to come up with them just you know, like the Can- canadian hockey athletes i don't know or some, yeah. so, just something like that and st- just remove the team canada branding and all aspects of that organization and have the same people play and they would have yeah. won the the gold medal the same exact way and they would have done everything exactly the same but now because it's team canada they get to be like, oh well, look at us. We're we're winning again and we're all we're all good and we're we're incredible at this sport and oh, you know, oh Canada, we're we're incredible. But like, yeah, the the organization doesn't deserve the the gold medal, especially right now. I mean, hey, why don't you deal with your internal issues first and then you, and then we and then we could talk about what's going on, on the ice. But yeah. Maybe 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 look inside for a little bit and then and then we'll come back to it. The one thing I want to touch on here before we move on to the next topic, uh, the World Junior Tournament, it's interesting because you get to see the different styles blend because people playing in different leagues, every developmental league has a slightly different style. But th- over the course of these tournaments, the elite players always shine because they're that much better than everybody else. Yeah, And when you're at that age group, you start thinking about how much better the best 17-year-old is on Team Canada versus the best 17-year-old on Team, I don't know, I think Denmark was in the tournament this year for the first time in a while, something like that. And you just get to see how the different hockey federations are working and developing. I, I know there's always a little bit of a groundswell, and I, I read something, I want to say it was Travis Yost wrote, of TSN wrote this last year, that there's a real concern that T- America, um, um, USA Hockey is – developing better high-end players than Hockey Canada and that the greater point producers uh, over time are slowly becoming more American and that there is real concern amongst Hockey Canada for that going forward. And all this is building up to me asking, can we just get a normal best-on-best international hockey tournament for the love of God? I know they're supposedly going to do the World Cup of Hockey again, I think next year, which that's something, but doing it once every like nine years, that every four years, if you don't want to shut the season down for the Olympics, fine. Start the regular season a month later, do the world cup of hockey for the love of God. 
I have been pitching this since I was in high school. World Cup of Hockey, Prudential Center, Madison Square Garden, Barclays Center, UBS Arena. You do it like a junior hockey tournament. You bring all the best players in the world to the biggest media market in the United States, and you let the best players showcase their talents for the world because we have been deprived of this. We have missed a Sidney Crosby, Connor McDavid in the Olympics two cycles now. That's two Olympic cycles we could have seen the best two players of their generations on the same team. And it sucks because it's purely out of greed. It is purely out of greed that we don't have a best on best international hockey tournament. So I, I was with you up until you said like Prudential Center, I machine all these things like, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it would be great for us because we're in the area. But I think hockey here is already an established market. I think what you do is you go to if you go to L.A., you go to you go to California. Yeah. Vegas go to, would be fun. You go you to California. You can, or you know, you could do Nevada. You could do a, a yeah. Nevada, Arizona I, kind of kind of triangle I, there. Yeah. Like you can do those things because, like, if if you're coming, if you're going to a game for the first time and you're thinking like, oh, like who are these kids that are supposed like being hyped up to play, and you get a ticket to it, and you see Connor Bedard, you know, just race down the ice and score a goal, and it's everybody goes like. That like that's how you get the fans. And Madison Square Garden tickets are going to cost three thousand dollars because it's Madison Square Garden, and you get the suits that are going to show up to the event, and that's it. But if you go to you know California and Nevada and and Vegas and and these others and these other markets that are up and coming, that that's where you grow the game, and that's where you get the next Austin Matthews, who, as we all know, Arizona born and raised, and who, you know, like we, we need more of those people. We need more Arizona and, and Nevada and, and just like these, these atypical markets, uh, yeah. non tip, like non typical markets th for that, that arise from all of this. So I, I'm with you, but we gotta, we gotta get these players into, into markets that otherwise would not be seeing such incredible high end talent all in the same week or whatever, however long it is. That is one thing I will say they've done a decent job with the all-star game of is making sure it is in those smaller non-traditional markets. They do that with the draft as well. They're double dipping this upcoming year. They're putting both in Nashville, which is an interesting idea of itself because that's already such a tourist destination to get people to come to the draft or to get them to come to um, the all-star game in Nashville. That is going to be a real good opportunity for the NHL to further that footprint, the Predators making the cup final, I think that was six years ago, seven 16, years ago now. 16, I think it was. Yeah, so six years ago now, that was a really good establishing foothold. It would have been really nice for the NHL if the Stars had been able to play at home during the course of their finals. Tampa is really a building itself out into a market. So good. That's the that's the overarching theme with a lot of informed hockey fans' gripes with the NHL is – you have a great game and all of this great talent. You got to get in front of more people. You got to find ways to grow the sport organically because you can do, you can try your best to just say, we're going to get by with the fans we already have, but that's doing your game a disservice because there are a lot of people out there who are willing to be tapped into for hockey. Okay. We already went long. So I'm going to table the one thing on the rundown and we'll use it next week. Parting shot. Andrew gave me this idea, and it's very funny because I actually had a semi-serious one written down about how, I, I, as even as someone who consumes as much information as I do, I still need to know when to be quiet if I don't know what I'm talking about and do a little more research. And then Andrew started talking about Kale McCarr's feet. And that <laughs> Dude, that like, picture, oh my god, man. Like... I, I can't. I still. I still can't believe it's a real picture. Like for for the keeper of the cup to be like, okay, we're gonna take this picture, but we're gonna do it at such an angle that is just the most like, Dogs objectively out. just strange, strange angle to take a picture of. And on top of that, like, dude, just crop it out. Just crop them out, man. Like you, 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 you already know when you're taking the picture that it's a weird picture. Like. It's, it's an, the, it, it was really funny because the keeper of the cup posted it and he posted it like, you know, the whole picture and the NHL account cropped it in their like Instagram feed. That was really funny because even the NHL was like, oh, it's a little weird for me. I'm going to crop it out a little bit. But but uh, but uh, the keeper of the cup was like, nope, 
full picture, no problem at all. There's there's two scenarios there. Either he took the picture and didn't show Kale McCarr, or he did show Kale McCarr and Kale was totally okay with it. Either way, weird, man. That's just weird. Weird angle. Take a different Andrew, one. Andrew, we're growing the sport. That yeah. got a post on that definitely <laughs> got posted on WikiFeet. That got oh posted my on God. WikiFeet. We're growing the game. Dogs out, Andrew. Yeah. Dogs Dude, I, are out. Uh, yeah. It's a weird picture. Take, take a new one. Take a new picture. Yeah, uh, I agree. 100%. Take a new one. Or crop it. Just crop it. God invented the crop tool for some reason. Well, yeah, right. some guy at Apple invented the crop tool for some reason. <laughs> All right, Andrew. Hit me with your shot and let's get out of here. Oh, my God. I don't have one. And that's okay. Because <laughs> it's, it's literally August. First of all, like uh, I, that... That that other parting shot just like uh, it took all it took everything I had away, but also like it's it's August twenty second. Just get me to October. Just get me to October, man. You're greedy. I, get me to September. Yeah, get me, I guess I get am. Me to training camp. I mean, yeah, but even training camp, like a lot of these guys are they they pretty much like have no shot to get there, or they're years away from getting there, or they're AHLers that got an invite because people are nice about it. Like a lot of players that are there aren't going to make the team. And yeah, I mean, there could be one or two surprises that make like the, a fourth line forward or a seventh defenseman or things like that. But overall, there's not going to be a, a massive surprise that we're going to see in training camp. So yeah, I, while, while there's going to be more than zero things to talk about in training camp, which it's August 22nd, and there's pretty much zero things to talk about now, but we've been going for 50 minutes anyway. We've been doing it for, at, over the course of, the month of August, there's been one piece of news that's been Ranger centric. That's been Jacob Trouba getting the C. Otherwise, it's been just a massive nothingness, and we've been filling hours and hours of yelling and and and, and debating things. So we we made it this far. We can do it during the season, no problem. But I just want it to be October, man. I want the games to matter again. I want to see some good hockey again. Well, it's not gonna be ho- it's not gonna be good hockey. Maybe in the first couple of weeks, uh, people are still getting their their summer you know their summer cheeseburgers out the way, and people are getting their you know their sea legs under them. But I get me to October, man. I it's there's there's, o- there's only so many days of nothing going on that as as a hockey fan, I'm just I'm craving. I just want to see Buffalo and Arizona play. Like that's all I want. I, if, if they played He's right now, horrendous. I would turn it on and I would watch it because I'm a psychopath when it comes to this sport. Like if they were playing right now, it's on the TV screen. Like I'm watching it. Give me, give me to October, please, 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 please. Andrew is down horrendous right now. He's down so bad. Arizona, Arizona Coyotes play hockey. Okay, <laughs> I thought of a question while you were talking there that we can use to wrap up with. You mentioned it that there's probably not going to be a whole lot of intrigue with training camp to think about. Right now, August 22nd, will the Rangers let Brennan Othman have his nine games in the NHL and then send him back to junior hockey because he's not AHL eligible? Or will they just send him back to junior hockey right away after training camp? Gun to your head, knee-jerk reaction. No thinking. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question. I feel like it depends on how he does in training camp. If he he impresses in training camp enough to the point where, hey, like – you know, let's let's see how he plays for maybe may, may, it doesn't even have to be all nine, right? He yeah. just has to impress long enough to get a look, and if yeah. he impresses long enough in training camp to get a couple of games, that would be great. But I think that hinges on how he plays in training camp, maybe during the preseason when they have spots available, and just 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 to see how he fares at the NHL level. If he impresses there, then sure. And almost an hour in the middle of August. What if you're listening to any other podcast? I don't know what you're doing. I really don't. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what any other hockey podcast is talking about right now. If you're a Rangers podcast, anyway, because like we 53 minutes now, and we've it's it's August 22nd. The biggest news happened a few days ago with Kadri. We're out here screaming about Kale McCarr. <laughs> And the, and that strange picture that is circulating the internet. We're we're talking about we we've been yelling for almost an hour. I mean, if this is the best and most objective Rangers podcast on the planet, and this is why. Okay, Andrew, we'll get the people out of here. You can follow the show, Twitter and Instagram, Liberty Blue Pod on YouTube. It's Liberty Blue Podcast. The show will be streaming live at seven p.m. on Monday evening. So. If you are around, you might catch it there. If not, we're available on all your favorite podcasting platforms. 
You can follow me at Nick Sarar, C-A-R-A-R-I-S on Twitter. You can follow Andrew at Chelney Andrew, C-H-E-L-N-E-Y Andrew on Twitter. Uh, we'll be back next week, and I have no idea what we're going to talk about. We'll figure I have it out. No- I, mean, I didn't know what we were going to talk about today, and then we filled an hour. So anything yeah. is anything is possible. Everything is cool when you're part of the dream. So that's what the, Kevin Garnett the team. That's what Kevin Garnett was talking about. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. You're right. He was just singing the song. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. We'll All right. We'll see you guys. We'll see you guys next week. Have a good one. Later.